Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in Physical Science. Um, I hope you've had a good day so far. Um, today we're going to carry on with doing mixed questions in work energy and power. And I know it looks a bit weird, but that's because we've already started this question. So I'm going to carry on with this question and I'll get to the point where we were at. And if you have just joined us today for the first time, I would seriously urge you to go and watch yesterday's lesson and you will see how we did this. Um, otherwise, just watch as we go along now and then watch the rest of the questions as we go. Great tools. The reason I'm spending so much time working on the work, energy, power and momentum questions is because they actually are quite large mark allocations for these questions in the final exams. So I like to make sure that my students know how to do these. So this is where we were at. We were using energy principles only to calculate the velocity of the cannon at point B. And what had we done? We had worked out that what did we work out? Okay, we worked out the F net, the horizontal force on the object, was the force of gravity parallel, which is down the slope, plus the force of friction, which is opposite to the direction of motion. And this was cannon was going down the slope. And we worked out that the net force acting on the cannon while it was going down the slope was 6.21. Now we need to use the work energy theorem because it says using energy principles only using energy principles only calculate the velocity of the cannon at point b so we want the velocity of the cannon at this point here point b okay so we've got f the delta x is 0.5 so let's do it we've got f net is 6,21 times by the change in displacement which is 0,5 is equal to k final minus k initial. Now the k initial is a half m v i squared. Okay, and we know what the velocity is there. It is 0 0.2 meters per second because they tell us that. They say the cannon reaches point A with a speed of 0 0.2 meters per second. We know the mass of the cannon. They told us it's 1.6 kilograms. So we can actually fill that in. It becomes 6,21 times by 0,5 is equal to kf minus a half times a 1,6 times by 0,2 squared. Okay, so let's work that out first. We've got 6,21 times by 0,5 plus a half times 1,6 times 0,2 squared is equal to the final kinetic energy. So let's work that out first before we do anything else. Let's clear this. So we've got 6.21 times 0.5 equals plus bracket 0.5 times 1.6 times 0.2 squared all close brackets equals that number there, which is 3,137. So 3,137 equals the final kinetic energy, which is a half times by the mass of the cannon, which is 1,6 times the final velocity squared. So therefore we need to divide both sides by 0, 0,5, that's what a half is, and 1,6, 0, 0.5, 1,6, if we do that, these cancel, and then we need to square root that. So let's do that. Okay, so what do we do? We go 3.137 divided by bracket 0 0.5 times hmm, 1.6 close bracket equals, and then we square root the answer equals, and it becomes 1.98. So VF equals 1,98 meters per second. So there we go. We now know the velocity of the cannon at point B is 1,98 meters per second. And we expected it to be faster than what it was going before for the simple reason that the force of gravity was pulling it down the slope. Right, let's do this question. And I think this is my last, let me have a look. 
no, got a couple more, my bad. Sorry, but after I finished all these questions, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to um, organic chemistry. So let's have a look at this one. It says, during a fire extinguishing operation, helicopter remains stationary. So it remains stationary, so that it has got no acceleration, so the acceleration equals zero. Right above a dam while filling a bucket of water. The bucket has a mass of 80 kgs, right? And is filled with 1,600 kilograms of water. That's the H2O. Okay, the bucket, okay. It is lifted vertically upward through a height of 20 meters at a constant speed of two meters per second. So again, the acceleration is zero. The tension in the cable is 17,000 newtons. It says the steam there is no sideways motion and you can ignore air friction. Okay, so now it says, state the work energy theorem in words. So what are they hinting? They're hinting that we have to use the work energy theorem for something in this question. We need to use the work energy theorem for something. Okay, and there it is. Use the work energy theorem. Okay, so now what do we know? The work energy theorem is basically stating that the work done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. The work done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Now it says draw a free body diagram, a labeled free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the bucket of water while being lifted upwards. Okay, so let's do it over here. So we've got obviously the force of gravity. Okay, and we've got the tension. And obviously the force of gravity is also going to be the force of gravity of the water, which is much bigger. So let's just do this one as the force of gravity of the bucket. Okay, so you don't have to do it separately. I'm just doing them separately so you can see. That's it. Those are the only forces acting on it. And in fact, I'm going to combine that. I'm going to erase this and say that this here is the force of gravity of the bucket and the water. Okay, it's acceleration due to gravity of the bucket and the water times by the mass of both. Okay, now it says, use the work energy theorem to calculate the work done by air friction, but they just said, air fri oh, air friction is not ignored. <gasps> Okay, <laughs> force of friction. Okay, now it says, use the work theory, energy theorem to calculate the work done by air friction on the bucket after moving through a height of 20 meters. Okay, so we know that work done is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Okay, but they're kind of tricky here because there's no change in kinetic energy. Do you agree the change in kinetic and the velocity here was two meters per second? Okay, so do you agree that there is no actual change in kinetic energy? But what has happened is that this thing has gained height and it's done some work against gravity against air friction. Okay, it has gained height and it's done some work against friction. Now it says use the work energy theorem to calculate the work done by air friction on the bucket after moving through a height of 20 meters. Okay, now we also know that work done is equal to force times velocity. Where's that power? Hang on a minute. Um, let me think. Um, the unit for this is newtons meters per second, which is kilograms meters per second, meters per second. Power is work over time, which is, yeah, no, that's power. Power is force times velocity. Okay, so now let us see what we can work out. Okay, actually, no, I'm right, it is force times velocity. Sorry, I'm having a blonde day. So now, do we agree that we can work out, we can use the force and we can use the velocity to find out the power and also the work done? We also know that the force that's been applied is 17,000 newtons and we're traveling at two meters per second. We have gained 
kinetic and en potential energy of 20 meters and we have done some work against friction so this year is going to be 17,000 newtons times my velocity of two okay that is going to equal the potential energy I've gained, which is going to be the mass of this together, which is 1,680, times by the gravity acceleration, 9.8, times the height I've gained, which is 20, plus the work done against friction, okay? Otherwise, all of this would be converted into that. So this is 34,000 is going to be, and obviously I need to put this in our calculator because I don't remember it. I mean, I can't work it out. It's 1680 times 9.8 times 20. Ooh, so that is 329. I'm right. 329280. 329280 plus the work done against friction. Okay. So, we obviously need to subtract those. I just want to check my numbers. It's 1,680 times by 9.8 times 20. And this is a 1,600 kilogram with an 80 kilogram. So, therefore, that's right. And it's moving through 20. And that's perfectly correct. So, therefore, the work done against friction, and yes, it should be negative because it's in the opposite direction. And also because not actually, no. The work done against friction is negative, but not because it's in the opposite direction, but because we are subtracting energy from the system. We are subtracting energy from the system. So, therefore, we can say that there is going to be 329. 280 minus plus 34,000. Okay, and let's do that. So we go minus 34, 1, 2, 3 equals 295,280 minus 295,280 joules. And the negative just shows that we are subtracting energy from the system. Hmm. Okay, nice question. Let's move on. Now, it says the diagram below shows a heavy block of mass 100 kilograms sliding down a rough inclined plane. So it's actually moving this way, it's moving down it, okay? But there's a constant force applied on the block parallel to the inclined plane as shown. So it is actually being pulled up with a force. Okay, the block slides down with a constant velocity, which again shows that acceleration is zero, which means that our net force is zero. And then it tells us that the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force between the block and the surface is 266 newtons. So we know that there's a force of friction, which equals 266 newtons. Okay, that's quite cool. Now it says, Friction is a non-conservative force. What is meant by the term non-conservative force? Okay, there are two ways you can answer this. The first way that we can answer it is by saying that it takes energy out of the system. So therefore, it does not conserve the energy principle, which says that energy will be conserved um, and can only be transferred from one form to another, cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, that's the one thing. The second thing to realize is that friction is dependent on the path. It's dependent on the path and non-conservative forces are dependent on the path that they travel. So the longer the path, the more we will experience this force, okay? In other words, if I had to say to you, what is the force of gravity that is acting on this object like, yeah, okay, right? It wouldn't matter, a minute, it wouldn't matter if I, let me show you. The force of gravity is in this direction, towards the center of the Earth. This year is the distance that the force of gravity acts over. It doesn't matter how far along the slope or how long the slope is. That is the direction and the displacement that the force of gravity acts over because force of gravity only acts downwards, okay? So similarly, if you, for example, uh, decided to jump out of an airplane and let's pretend that's the earth and let's say you're jumping really high, you like that crazy dude that jumped out of a, the top of the atmosphere, it doesn't matter 
if you do this, okay? Because the force of gravity is pulling you straight down, okay? So that there is important, whereas the force of friction actually follows the path that you're traveling in and therefore it is non-conservative. Now it says write down the network done on the block. The network done on the block. Well, we know that, it says write down, we know that the work done is equal to delta K, okay? We know that the net force, we also, okay, we also know that delta K, it work done is equal to F delta X, okay? No. So the F is zero, therefore there is no work done. So the correct answer here is a zero. Now it says calculate the magnitude of the force. And by the way, this is the net force, eh? The net force. Calculate the magnitude of the force. Okay. So now they want the force F. So what they were hinting when they asked us to work out what the network was done was that we could realize that F net was equal to zero. Therefore, the sum of all the forces acting on this object is going to be zero. But let's talk about what the forces are. And let's just draw a free body diagram to think about what all the forces are that are acting on this object. Do you agree that there is the force of gravity going down? Here is my slope. Okay. There is big F, which is pulling it up. There is the force of friction. Force of friction. And the force of gravity can be broken up into two forces. The normal force, or sorry, there is a normal force, if normal. There is the force of gravity perpendicular, which is the same as the normal force in size. And there's the force of gravity parallel, Fg parallel. Okay, so now if that's the case, we have this force, this force and this force. Those three forces together are acting on the object to actually make sure that the net force parallel to the surface is zero. So we've got the force of gravity parallel plus the force applied plus the force of friction. Now, again, I hear somebody screaming about the fact that some of these in the opposite direction, so how dare I do pluses, but the definition of a net force is the sum of all the forces. So if you don't like writing it like this, but you need to show that it's the sum of all the forces, what you can do is you say, can say right at this point at the beginning that let the direction that we positive be down the slope. Then you've got Fg parallel plus minus the force applied plus minus the force of friction. But grade 12s, you need to show that you know that the net force is the sum of all the forces. You need to show that somewhere in your calculations so that you get the marks for it, okay? Otherwise, you're not going to get the marks. So, Fg parallel, we need to work out. This little angle here is 25 degrees. This here is 100 times by 9.8, okay? And we want Fg parallel, so we're going to use Sakatoa. This is the opposite side. That's that part in use, so we're going to use sine. So we're going to go sine sine of 25 degrees equals Fg parallel over 98. Therefore, 98 sine 25 degrees equals Fg parallel. And we're going to pop that in our calculator. We're going to go 98 times sine of 25 close bracket equals and that becomes 41.42, so that's 41,42 newtons is Fg parallel. And let's just go back there, I'm just going to show you something. Notice that you always round off to the second decimal place, so that means you look at the third one, 
Okay, you don't look up down here. We just look at the third one, and that is a six, which is bigger than five, or five. And, it's, yeah. So therefore, because it's five and bigger, we round that up to a two. So it becomes forty-one point four two. Okay, so now we know that that is forty-one comma four two. Plus, they want this, so this becomes minus the force applied, minus the force of friction, which they've given us is 266, and that equals zero. Okay, so let's take everything across. You get 266 minus 41,42 is going to be minus the force applied. Okay, so let's just do that on our calculators. So we go um, 266 minus 41.42 equals 224.58 comma 58 equals minus fa therefore the force applied is equal to minus 224 comma 58 and what did they do they asked for the magnitude of the force they just wanted the size so you can just ignore that. So that is the size. And remember, you always have to put your units in. If they hadn't asked for the magnitude, if they just said calculate the force of F, you would have had to say that it is 224.58 newtons up the slope. But they didn't. They just asked for the magnitude. So therefore, we now have that this is 224,58 newtons. Right. Now they say if the block was released from rest, okay? So our initial velocity equals zero, and it's without the force F being applied. So the force F is not there, okay? It moves three meters down the slope to the bottom of the inclined plane. So it moves three meters, three meters. And they want to know to calculate the speed of the block at the bottom of the inclined plane. They want the speed of the block at the bottom of the inclined plane. Okay, so do you agree that the, if the force applied wasn't there, then the resultant force on the object would be this 224.58 newtons because that is the size of the force of the sum of these two forces, the force of friction and the force of gravity down, force of friction and the force of gravity down, right? That there is equal to 224.58. So now we have F net is equal to 224,58, right? We have the initial velocity zero. We have delta x is equal to three. Do you agree we could work out the final velocity in two ways? And they don't say which way to do it. They don't say you have to use energy um, methods and they don't say you have to use equations of motion. So we have either or. I'm going to go with the energy method because we're doing questions on work, energy, and power. So I'm going to erase this because we don't need it anymore. And we actually don't need the free body diagram anymore. So this can go as well. Right. So we know that F net delta X equals the work done, which equals delta K. We have the net force, to ching We have the delta X, to ching We have the initial velocity, it's zero. So can we work out the final velocity? Yes, because we have mass, yay. So we can say 224,58 times by three is equal to half times by the mass of 100, times Vf squared minus zero, okay, because initial velocity is zero. So therefore, we can pop this in our calculator, and we can go 224.58 multiplied by three equals 673.74, 673.74 is equal to 50 Vf squared, so we can divide both of these sides by 50 
and then we can square root it. So let's do that. So we're going to divide it by 50 and then we're going to square root the answer and we get 3.67. So the final velocity is 3.67 meters per second. And they've asked for speed, which means we don't need to give direction. So therefore the correct answer is 3.67 meters per second. Okay, next. Right. This question is actually a very popular question. I don't know why, but it is. It's a very popular question. They love asking this type of question in the finals. Okay, so let's go through it slowly. It says the diagram below shows a track ABC, ABC. The curved section AB is frictionless and the rough horizontal section is eight meters. So what does that mean? It means that there's a force of friction. An object of mass 10 kilograms is released from point A, which is four meters above the ground. It says it's released, which means the chances are it has zero velocity, it's released. It slides down the track and comes to rest at point C. Yeah, the final velocity is zero as well. Now it says, state the principle of conservation of mechanical energy in words. Okay, so the principle of conservation of mechanical energy is that the sum of the mechanical energy in an isolated system remains constant, okay? In other words, what are we saying? We're saying the sum of the potential energy and kinetic energy in an isolated system remains constant. Why are they asking us to state it? Well, they're obviously asking us to state it because of the fact that we are going to have to use it. So if you're thinking that, what are we thinking? We're thinking potential energy plus kinetic energy at the top equals potential energy plus kinetic energy at the bottom, right? Right. Now it says, is mechanical energy conserved as the object slides from A to C? Write only yes or no, and the correct answer is no. Why? Because of the friction over here. From A to B, yes, mechanical energy is conserved because there's no friction. From B to C, nope, no, because there is friction. Now it says, use energy principles only. Calculate the magnitude of the frictional force exerted on the object as it moves along BC. Okay, then. Okay. And do you see it travels? This is eight meters long. Okay. So do you agree that, yeah, we've got EP plus EK. And at B, we've got EP plus EK. Okay, because there's no energy loss due to friction, we know that EP plus EK at the top has to equal EP plus EK at the bottom, right? So do you agree that I could work out the kinetic energy over here, right? Then I've got the final velocity at zero, so we know that the K final is going to be zero. We have the distance, it's eight meters. So therefore we can work out the frictional force because we know that F delta X is equal to delta K, but that would be from B to C. But in order to do that, we need to first use the conservation of mechanical energy in the section from A to B. So what are we saying? We're saying from A to B, we've got EP plus EK at the top has to equal EP plus EK at the bottom. It has to. Okay, now if that's the case, then we need to make sure that, I'm just checking my, yes, okay. We're gonna have to use this. So is there any kinetic energy at the top? No, because it says it was released. So we've got MGH from the potential energy is equal to is there any potential energy at the bottom here? No, there isn't because there's no height. So that is zero plus a half mv squared. 
Now, I'm happy that this equation's worked out like this, so I can show you something. An important thing is to realize that this part of the question, we actually don't need the mass. So if you're ever given a question where they ask you to work out something with to do with conservation of mechanical energy and you're not given the mass of the object, then I've had students before go, oh, we can't do it, we don't have the mass. You can do it because this mass is the same as that mass, so they cancel. So you end up with GH, is equal to a half v squared. Therefore, v is equal to the square root of 2gh, which is the square root, in this case, of 2 times 9,8 times 4. So we need the calculator. And this also proves, by the way, that acceleration due to gravity is only dependent on, is independent of the mass, but that's beside the point. Okay, so we've got 2 times 9.8 times the height of 4 equals, and then we square root the answer, and we get something stupid, so it becomes 8.85. So the velocity is 8,85 meters per second, but that's over here. That's there. That's 8,85 meters per second. Now we need to use the work energy, uh, work energy theorem. So do you see we've used energy principles for the first bit, we've used conservation of energy, and now we're going to use the work energy theorem. So we've got we want the frictional force. We've got the delta x, it is 8 meters. Okay, and this is k final minus k initial. Now the k final is zero because the final velocity is zero. Minus a half times the mass of 10 times the initial velocity of 8,85 is equal to f times by eight. So therefore f is going to be five negative, 5 times by 8,85 all divided by 8. And we're expecting this force to be negative because it's a frictional force. So it's in the opposite direction to movement. So let's clear and you go 5 times 8.85 divided by 8 equals 5.53. So that's 5,53 newtons and it's negative. Why is it negative? Because it's in the opposite direction. But again, you need to check and they've asked you for the magnitude. They've asked you for the magnitude. So therefore, you don't need to give a direction. You can say, well, the magnitude of the frictional force is just 5,53 newtons. Hmm, not too bad. Hey, Right, I think this is definitely, yes, this is definitely the last question before we hit organic chemistry. I'm quite excited. Okay, so let's have a look at this question. It says, a container of mass 120 kilograms, let's write that in, 120 kilograms, is hanging from a steel cable attached to a crane and it's accelerated vertically. So there is an acceleration through a height of 12 meters. The container reaches a maximum speed. Oh, there's a 12 meters, sorry. I was getting excited. Okay, so there's the 12 meters. Okay, it reaches a maximum speed of five meters per second after it's reached the 12 meters, okay? Now it says, draw a labeled free body diagram showing all the forces acting in the container as it accelerates upwards. And they don't mention the force of friction. So I'm going to assume that there is no force of friction. So I'm drawing my free body diagram here. So let's think about it. What are the forces acting on this? Do you agree that there's a tension up due to the cable and there's the force of gravity down? Okay, they do not mention, okay, use it to calculate the work done on the container by friction, and there's a force of friction. 
force of friction. That's why you read the questions. Okay, so let's go through this again. We've got a container of mass 120 kilograms hanging from a steel cable attached to the crane is accelerated vertically upwards from rest. Initial velocity is zero. Through a height of 12 meters, as shown in the diagram, the container reaches a maximum speed of five meters per second after being lifted through a height of 12. First, it says draw a labeled free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the container to accelerate upwards. Then it says if the tension in the cable is 800 newtons, calculate the work done by the cable to move the container to a height of 12 meters. Then it says state the work energy theorem. And then it says use energy principles to calculate the work done on the container by friction while it is moving to a height of 12 meters. Okay, so first of all, we've finished our free body diagram because we've got the tension. We know now that there is friction, so friction will always be in the opposite direction to movement. And there is, of course, the force of gravity. Okay, so now it says, if the tension in the cable is 800 newtons, calculate the work done by the cable to move the container to a height of 12 meters. So work done equals F delta X, okay? They only want the work done by the cable. They're not talking about the work in the system. They just want the work done by the cable. We are going to have to work, done, work calculate the work in the system by the work done on the container, okay, when we are finished. But the work done just by this is going to be 800 Newtons times by the 12 which is 9,000, 9,600 joules, 9,600 joules. So the work done by the cable, just by the cable, just to move it at a con, it's accelerating, but just to move it through this displacement was 12 meters is 9,600 joules. Okay, now it says take the work energy theorem, which says the work done is equal to delta K, right? So now we say, okay, well, that's fine. Then what should happen is that this 9,600 joules should equal the delta K, right? But now they say there is energy lost due to work done against friction. So this time the work done is going to equal to delta K plus the work done against friction some of this energy is going to be used to overcome the force of friction. Okay, so we know that this is 9,600. The final velocity is five, so it's a half times the mass of the object, which is 120, times the final velocity, which is five squared, minus K initial, which is zero because the final initial velocity is zero plus the work done against friction. So do you agree you got 9,600 is equal to 60 times by 25 plus W F. So if you got 9,600 minus this number here, which is a zero and five sixes are 30, carry three, six twos are 12, 13, 14, 15. 1500 is the work done against friction. Therefore, you've got zero, zero, one, eight joules equals the work done against friction. So the work done against friction is 8,100 joules. That is how much energy was used up to overcome the force of friction. The rest was used to accelerate the object to a velocity of five meters per second in those 12 meters. Right, okay, so grade 12s, we're now gonna talk about organic chemistry. Okay, now you need to understand something very important about organic chemistry. Organic chemistry plays a huge role, not only in everyday life, but also in your chemistry 2 paper. Up to 60% of your chemistry 2 paper is made up of organic chemistry. Um, they pull that out uh, by using organic chemistry in your rates of reaction, in your chemical equilibria, it's obviously in your fertilizers and 
um, it can it's, it can be in your well it's always in your fertilizer industry and it because of your ammonium nitrates and things like that and then obviously it is also going to be um, I've lost my train of thought I'm sorry it's obviously going to be in all the other types of questions but the actual part of organic chemistry makes up up to 60% of your paper so you guys need to study organic chemistry and unfortunately most of organic chemistry is study work so I'm going to explain it to you as best I can and then you need to go and study it and then you need to go do old exam paper questions, okay? A lot of it is basic theory. There is quite a bit of understanding as well, but if you don't learn your theory, you can't apply your understanding. So you really need to study this section. It's a huge section in your paper too. Okay, so what is organic chemistry? <sighs> organic chemistry is a branch of chemistry that deals with organic molecules. Okay, so back in the day, years and years ago we people used to still play in sand in Greece and were belong to the kings and the emperors and everything else they used to believe that objects either had a life force or they didn't okay so in other words something either had a life force and it was actual a life force was something that flowed through you okay and that's what made things living Subsequently to that, they've realized that organic chemistry, and organic means moving or changing, okay? Organic chemistry is the chemistry has to contain carbon. But now listen, this is very important. If something contains carbon, it doesn't mean it's organic, okay? But all organic molecules on Earth, please note, on Earth, have to contain carbon. Now, Years and years ago, when people were really big on NASA finding alien life forms, they used to say, we have not yet found a carbon-based life form. And the reason that they mentioned that is because all life on Earth is carbon-based. So therefore, they were assuming that all life in the rest of the universe, if you believe in that, is based on carbon okay but that's a bit narrow-minded because if you're going to have think about aliens and you're going to go for that thinking that okay fine there's a possibility that there's aliens which there is a possibility our universe is infinitely large then there is no reason why it has to also be a carbon-based life form okay but that's beside the point so every organic molecule on earth contains carbon okay but you get a lot of things like your carbon monoxide your carbon dioxide your cyanides your carbonates your carbonic acid which is the acid you find in your coca-cola they are non-organic okay so that's important there are other elements that are also associated with organic compounds and those are your hydrogens oxygens yourself for your phosphorus or nitrogen okay so what we're going to do is from tomorrow we're going to continue with organic compounds and then we're going to go through organic chemistry so i really urge you to maybe read up on your gamma chemistry tonight if you've got a chance and make sure you understand where I'm coming from. If not, it's fine, just join me tomorrow in the lesson and I will teach you some more about organic chemistry. Right, that's it for tonight. Have a great day.